I will give you a brief overview and introduction in the different types of electric motors that you see today in electric cars, their benefits, advantages, probably also the disadvantages. Um, before I start, just a brief uh, overview of what we are going to do in the next half hour. Uh, after introduction motivation, I will in uh, particular give you a comparison of two different applications. We have made comparisons for a 85 kilowatts drive, which is uh, probably in the Golf class region, uh, to describe it best. And then we have a second comparison done for a 45 kilowatt drive, which is a very smaller, small car, subcompact car, um, and see what, what happens there. I have also a brief, but a very brief part on production aspects and safety aspects because the three motor types are quite different when it comes to production and safety and then of course the conclusion. Before we start, as always, let me give you a very short introduction to where I'm coming from. As has already been said, I'm from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, the KIT, which is a merger. The KIT is a very young facility, only three or four years old. But the KIT has um, emerged from the Technical University of Karlsruhe, which is over 100 years old, and the Research Center Karlsruhe. And you see some figures there today. We are in the, among the big universities in Germany. We're not the biggest one, but we're among the biggest uh, ones. And um, I think we are the largest research facility, publicly funded research facility in Germany. My own uh, institute is uh, founded over 100 years ago, has been founded over 100 years ago, the Institute of Electrical Engineering. Today we have more than 40 people working at the institute. We have two professors, Professor Brown and myself. Professor Brown is uh, mainly focused on power electronics. He has been at the institute, with the institute for many, many years. And myself, I'm, as I said, all, only since three years at the Institute, and my focus is electric motors, electric drives, in particular motors for electric vehicles. Now, let's get started with the technology. When we talk about electric cars, um, I'm sure most of you know that there's a broad variety of different electric cars, starting with micro-hybrids and mild hybrids here on the left side of the chart, where the electric motor really only supports the combustion engine and doesn't do much for itself. It's just a very small motor. And then we come to the full hybrids in the middle of the chart. Full hybrid means the electric motor is strong enough to drive the car all by itself, albeit for a rather short distance, only a few kilometers. And then, of course, we get to the plug-in hybrids, cars that uh, have a big electric engine that can drive for 20, 30, 40, 50 kilometers at full speed. I was a little late this morning when I went to Stuttgart Airport and I was coming with an Opel Ampera and this is a full uh, hybrid, uh, full uh, plug-in, excuse me, plug-in hybrid and I can uh, tell you now firsthand it's able to drive 170 kilometers per hour with its electric motors. Okay, then, of course, there's a battery electric vehicle and the fuel cell vehicle, which only has an electric drive. The interesting thing here is what type of motor do we have in these cars? In the low electrified cars, we usually have motors that are supporting the combustion engine and they are integrated in the gearbox. So mostly we say this is gearbox integrated motors. motors. And if you look in the marketplace today, these gearbox integrated motors they are, I would say, 100% synchron synchronous machine permanent magnet motors. I know that one company has tried to build an induction motor for that purpose, but they never went into mass production, so all the cars, at least that I am aware of, um, use synchronous machines permanent magnet motors for gearbox integrated supportive electric drives. The more interesting thing is, and this is also what we're talking about today, is the traction drives meaning that the drives that really are strong enough to move the car all by themselves without the aid of a combustion engine. And there are many research projects on alternative drives, and we also do a couple of research projects at the university, but the three types of machines that are universally 
used in this application are PM motors with permanent magnets, P, uh, synchronous motors with permanent magnets, excuse me, synchronous motors with field windings, and induction motors. You find induction motors in Tesla mo uh, cars. You find synchronous machines with field windings in Renault cars, like the Zoe, for example. And most of the other cars, not all of them, but most of the other electric cars have permanent magnet synchronous machines. And today I'm going to compare these three types of machines. Here you can see some uh, very exemplary pictures. On the left hand, I've given some examples of gearbox integrated machines. The top picture is a very, very complicated drive, very technol not, uh, high technology drive from uh, cooperation between Daimler, BMW, and General Motors. Is already finished, was many years ago. The lower left picture is uh, from Toyota. And the pictures on the right, those are drives for traction purposes. The top one from Brusa, certainly very well familiar here, permanent magnet synchronous machine, and the lower one from Continental AG, the field winding synchronous machine. So when we talk about traction drives, what we need to do or need to know is that we have two operational areas. And when we talk about the details later of the design of the machines, these two operational areas become of high importance. First, if you look at the graphs, on the, on the lower axis, we have the speed. Okay? Unfortunately, this laser doesn't show up on the, on the screen, but you can see it on the lower axis, we have the speed. And then we have a left part and a right part of the graph. In the left part, we basically have constant torque. So that's the base speed range. We have constant torque, speed increases, that means power is increasing. And on the right half of the graph, we have constant power, the field weakening range. Torque is going down with a square, or with a uh, one over the speed, and the power remains constant. Typical cars today are designed so that the cutoff frequency between, between constant torque and constant power is somewhere in the range between 40 to 60 kilometers per hour. Sports cars probably a little higher. And uh, so it's very important to have motors that can utilize the high end, the high frequency range, the field weakening range. And this is already a point where the difference between the three drives come into play. Because if you have a requirement to weaken the field, to reduce the field, you can do that easily with a, permanent, um, with a field winding machine by reducing the field current. You can do that easily with an induction machine. It does it by itself, by the way. But you cannot do it easily with a permanent magnet machine. You have to add current to the SATA winding in the D-axis, but I'm not going through the details here, to reduce the field. So that's quite counterproductive. You add extra current to reduce the field which you didn't want in the first place, which is kind of crazy. Now let's go into the comparisons. First comparison that we made was, as I said, for a golf class uh, machine. It is not exactly this car that we've designed. The comparison is a couple of years old, but it is basically a golf class car. And um, when you do comparisons like that, it's always important to understand what are the fixed parameters and what are the variable parameters. In this case, the dimensions were fixed. Okay, so the, motor ma the, the manufacturer gave us the outer housing dimensions. And he said, you cannot be any bigger than that. You have to stay with a, within a diameter of 220 millimeters, which is the, the stator diameter, by the way, the stack diameter. You have to stay in a length of 270 millimeters, uh, which covers the iron plus the winding overhang. And also the inverter and the battery current, current was given and the gearbox ratio was given. So that's the, the, what we fixed. And then, of course, he said, do, do your best. Design three machines, do your best, whatever you can in these dimensions. I've given you also the performance that was uh, required for continuous operation. The torque was 160 Newton meters peak time, peak torque for short time, 270 Newton meters. Rated power was given for various uh, battery voltages, full and uh, empty battery up to 110 kilowatts peak power and the top speed 
was also given by the gearbox ratio and the desired speed. Now, let's first look at the results of the permanent magnet machine that we have designed. I hope you have all seen these graphs. For those of you who haven't, just a brief introduction. What you see on the horizontal axis, again, is the speed of the motor, starting at zero speed standstill and ending, in this case, at 12,000 speed. On the vertical axis, you see the torque. Um, in this case, the permanent magnet synchronous machine is limited at uh, probably 270 or 60 newton meters. This is the limit of the uh, battery and the inverter, not the limit of the machine, I should say. And then in color, you see the areas of constant efficiency. And you see that the peak efficiency of this machine is around 97%, and that, of course, only covers the machine. It doesn't even cover the friction losses. We only wanted to compare the different machine types. So we have not included converter losses, we have not included cable losses, we have not included friction, just the machine, okay? And 97, and then we've got a broad area of 96%. What you can also see, and that's quite, oh, let me first uh, continue to explain the graph. Then you see the field weakening range, which is the range where the maximum torque reduces. You see the constant torque range. You see the continuous torque range, which is the blue curve. This is the torque we can deliver continuously. Everything above the dark blue curve is just short time. Typical for permanent magnet synchronous machines, as you can see here, we've got a slight problem at top speeds. You see that when we go far into the field weakening area, then we've got a slight problems and the efficiencies are coming down. Also, we've got a slight problem at the low speed end when we need high torques. But this is probably not so dangerous because this is only going to be um, used in a startup phase when you start from a, from a red traffic light, for example. So you're only going to be there for a few moments. Now, the field winding machine is a lot better when it comes to the high speed range, which is not surprising because we can simply reduce the field current and then we have a better efficiency in the high speed range. The top efficiency that we can get, however, is reduced. We only have 96% now and the 95% range is the highest one now. And that's simply because we have extra losses in the rotor because we need to supply the rotor with current. And also we have a kind of a bigger problem here in the, in the low speed range, which I don't think is really important in practice. And finally, the induction machine. In this case, because we had fixed dimensions, uh, we couldn't make it big enough to uh, deliver all the peak torque that was required. Um, we have absolutely no problem in the high speed range. Again, as was expected, we have uh, still a bit, of, bit, a bit of a bigger problem here in the low speed range and the high torque range. And if you compare all three of these machines in one diagram, this is, these are the areas of their highest efficiency. So the 95% range of efficiency. And that's, that's quite typical. In the high end, in this particular case, because we had fixed dimensions, the permanent magnet machine is still the best, and the induction machine, in this case, scores lowest. Now, that obviously leaves the question open, why would a sports car company like Tesla use an induction machine? And I should probably not... Um, start with a conclusion now because we have a lot more to go through, but I can tell you for sure if we had a little bit more of space and if the space was not so restricted, if we could have made the machine a little bit bigger, the induction machine would be as good as the other ones. So you need to add some space, 10-20% more space, and then you can make a real good induction machine as well. Here's the data that we've gotten from those machines. You see the PMSM, Permanent Magnet Synchronous Machines, FESM, the Field Winding Synchronous Machine, and then ASM is Induction Machine. Because we had the outer dimensions fixed, 
the iron length of the machines was different. The field winding machine had the shortest iron length because we needed to supply the brushes to get the current into the rotor. The uh, induction machine is a little bit higher in length, which is good. And uh, the permanent magnet machine, of course, had single tooth windings, so we have no winding overhang. And that means it has the highest iron length, and that is also why it wins this comparison. Yeah, you see the, the green colors are the colors where we have been able to match the requirements of the OEM, and the red colors are those where we couldn't match them. Interestingly, the uh, FTP72 efficiency, and I will come back to that later again, the FTP72 efficiency of the permanent magnet machine is not so very good. And the reason for that is that the FTP72 driving cycle really uses a very, very low um, torque most of the time. And the permanent magnet machine is not so very good at low torques, low power. If you have a driving cycle that is more demanding, that has more power demand, like in a sports car, then the permanent magnet machine would be better. But in this particular cycle, it wasn't so good. We'll come to that later again. So second comparison, 45 kilowatt drive, subcompact category. You see an electric smart vehicle there. It was not for that particular car. It's just an exemplary picture. It was for a similar car. This comparison was different than the first one. In the first one, the outer dimensions were given. Okay, and we had the room practically was given and we had to design the machine into the available space as good as possible. In this case, we have designed all three machines with the same um, stack, with the same iron length and the same iron diameter, so the same magnetic stack. In other words, the uh, permanent magnet synchronous machine was the shortest and the field winding machine was the longest. Again, the voltage of the battery, in this case the voltage was uh, given, the voltage of the converter or inverter was given, gearbox ratio again was fixed and we have uh, performance requirements. Now, this time, <coughs> again, we, we'll have all three graphs now. Uh, the colors are reversed. I apologize for that. In the, the previous example, the best efficiency was red, which is probably not so clever. <laughs> In this graph, the best efficiency is green, as it should be. So again, starting with a permanent magnet machine, you can see there's a very small area of 98% efficiency, which is not really important. And the broad range is 97%. Again, you see there is a problem at low torques, but it's not so big as it was before. Here the field winding machine really shines. Very good result. The low torque range is extremely good. Starting range not so good, but I mean, who cares? It's not so important. And also the induction machines is very good, but it cannot deliver quite the high maximum torque as the other two machines. Here you see the comparison. And this, I would say, is a more typical picture that you would uh, expect from such a comparison. Again, this is the area of, these are the areas of highest efficiency. Permanent magnet machine, good at high torques, not so much in the low speed range. Um, field winding machine, and then induction machine. So, what we've done now is we've used these calculations and um, have then gone through a couple of driving cycles. Um, we have, of course, used the new European driving cycle, which is the standard cycle. We have also used the, uh, well, it's called new European, but it's not so new, actually. It's a very old cycle. It's, it's, in the, in the, the, it's being phased out right now. We have also used the common Artemis driving cycle, which consists of three um, parts, the urban road and motorcycle, highway cycle, and of course we have on our own I, uh, highway cycle with a test car, that's the one that I mentioned earlier, and we have uh, done a n number of test drives with that car, a couple of thousand kilometers, and recorded all the data to design our own driving cycles from different, different driving uh, situations. 
And this is the result. What you see here vertically, again, are the three machine types, permanent magnet machine, field winding machine, induction machine. And then from top to bottom, you see the different driving scenarios. Let's probably start here. New, new European driving cycle. Interestingly, in this particular comparison, the field winding machine wins. The overall efficiency. Again, this is only the motor efficiency, not converters, not cables, not even friction included. Just the motor efficiency to compare the motors. Then urban cycle. Permanent magnet machine is a little bit better. Road and highway cycle. Again, field winding machine wins. And then you see typical uh, driving scenarios on the top, like roundabout, start from a red traffic light or stopping at a red traffic light, entering the highway, exiting the highway, uh, passing another car, parking, and traffic jam. And, and what you see here basically is that there is no clear winner, of course, as you would have expected, but the, the bottom line is the induction machine never wins. <laughs> So it's always a fight between the field winding synchronous machine and the permanent magnet synchronous machine. However, as I said earlier, if you give the designers a chance to make the machine, let's say, 10 to 20% bigger, then the induction machine will be exactly in the same league as the other two. So it's just a question of accepting a little extra space and accepting a little extra weight. Otherwise, they are performance-wise, they're basically identical. So let me go briefly through some production aspects. Um, if you're familiar with windings, and I'm, I'm sure you are, otherwise you wouldn't be on this uh, trade fair, we have distributed windings, we have single-tooth windings. Single-tooth windings are extremely simple to manufacture, can be fully automized. Um, so they are very favorable, and many, many manufacturers actually favor these windings today. Unfortunately, for a designer of electric machines, they are horrible, absolutely horrible. Uh, Single-tooth windings have um, special harmonics in the air gap that are sometimes, or not sometimes, mostly, <laughs> depending on the design, a lot bigger than the fundamental wave. So it's really something that you don't want to have in your machine. The result is you have additional losses, you have noise, you have vibration. Um, the single tooth winding generally is not suited for induction machines because there is not uh, one single solitude sinusoidal wave that is inducing into the rotor and it reduces the efficiency. So in order to, to cover that and have a Electrically better winding, um, we would use the distributed winding, but of course it's much more expensive. It's a very complex uh, construction. You have to do a lot of hunt work to produce that winding. Therefore, we see today we see both windings in, in industry, and both have their, their, their applications. The rotor, permanent magnet machine, very simple construction. You just stamp a few sheets, enter the magnets, well, I know it's more complicated than that, but basically. <laughs> and then you have your permanent magnet machine. Field winding, very complex rotor construction. I know that uh, companies like Continental AG, they have a fully automized production, but it's not a simple one. There's a lot of work that has gone into this production. And then, of course, you have the induction machine on the far right. Very cheap material fully uh, automized, m a lot of experience in the industry, millions and millions and millions of these induction rotors are being produced every year. So from a production standpoint, the induction machine rotor is by far the simplest construction. Safety aspects, torque pulsation, also a problem. Um, permanent magnet machines, depending on how you design them, you can do a lot of things right and you can do a lot of things wrongly. Um, you may or may not get a lot of torque pulsations. Usually you don't have any torque pulsations or almost none in induction machines and field winding machines are somewhere in between. Torque build up time, so that means the time to build up the torque from the moment you push the pedal. Very good on a permanent magnet machine, not quite as good on a 
field winding machine, an average on an induction machine, but in reality, unless you want a super performing sports car, I think we agree that all three machines are much faster than what you would expect from your car, so that's not a real problem. What happens if you have an external short circuit? Um, that could happen through an accident. It could happen uh, through a failure in the electronics, power electronics. Some manufacturers even design their power electronics that in case of a failure, they produce a short circuit. If you have a, the permanent magnet machine, <clears throat> you have to take a lot of care to make sure that if you have a short circuit, the back EMF, the induced voltage, is not going to be higher than nominal voltage. It can be done, certainly. You can design the machine so that the back EMF is not going to be too high, but you have to accept a few compromises to do that, and you have to take a lot of care. I have seen motor designs where people didn't take that care, and they had tremendous problems with back EMF in case of short circuit. No problem at all, of course, in an induction machine. Zero back EMF, no problem in field winding machines, provided you can switch the rotor off quickly enough. Also, the problem of braking torque. If you have a short circuit, the uh, PM machine will give you braking torque. You may not want to have that if you're riding a car on the highway and you have, let's say, four motors, one on each uh, wheel, and then one of the motors one of the converters has a short circuit and the motor starts braking. It's not a good driving situation. Your car will spin off the highway. But then again, there are other scenarios where you have one machine for two wheels and you probably really don't care about the braking torque. So again, this is something that has to be um, looked at at the design phase and stage. At the end, I want to uh, conclude with um, comparison of power density. I think that's quite an interesting diagram. What you see here on the vertical axis is the power density, and I should say it's the power density for continuous operation. You can have the power density for short time operation, which is a lot higher, but uh, it's depending on many design parameters and environment parameters, so I'm giving you only the, the power density for short time operation here. And uh, it's given in kilograms per kilowatt. So how many kilograms of mass do you need of a motor to produce one kilowatt of mechanical output power? And this is a logarithmic scale. I'm a big fan of logarithmic scales. So that means practically small distances here on the vertical axis have a lot of practical meaning. And what you see here, with our induction machines that we use in industry today, the typical four pole 1500 RPM machine, we're somewhere in the region of 10 kilograms per kilowatt. When we go to PM industrial motors like robot drives, robotic drives, servo motors, we're somewhere in the region of two to three kilograms per kilowatt. When we go to traction motors, we're in the region of one kilogram per kilowatt. And PM machines are a little bit better and field winding and induction machines are probably a little bit worse, but it's not so much it's on the same level. Interestingly, um, this is the same level as we have for the typical combustion engine, for the diesel engine and the, the gas engine today. And if we really go to the extremes, and I've just seen an ex exhibition here at BAC, you can see the, the sports car there. If we really go to the extremes. Formula One racing car, we've built a curse drive for the Formula One racing car, and that was in the neighborhood of 0.2 kilograms per kilowatt. And I have to admit that was peak power. That was not uh, continuous operation. That was peak power. And my thinking is that in the next 10, 20 years, we will see power densities in this range, not only in the Formula One racing area, but also in mass production in every day's cars. Here's a short summar summary of all the findings. Power density certainly best in permanent magnet machines. Best point efficiency also best in permanent magnet machines. Driving cycle efficiency I think could be better in field winding machines, but it's really not dramatic, the differences. Manufacturing costs, very difficult to say, depends a lot on the magnet prices, depends a lot how much you put into 
automatization. Material costs, clearly a disadvantage for permanent magnet machines. Intrinsic safety and technical maturity, clearly an advantage for induction machines.